Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. Victorians have had a slight taste of freedom with Premier Dan allowing social visits, but the campaign to get our rights fully restored is far from over. All right. Let's get, get straight into our first featured guest for tonight's show. I'm sure many of you saw the ugly and aggressive actions of Victoria Police in shutting down the Mother's Day anti-lockdown protests outside Victoria's Parliament House. It was peaceful until Victoria Police moved in to break up the protest. They had to break social distancing themselves to enforce social distancing. This was right in the middle of a speech by one of the faces of the new online freedom movement in Australia, which has grown e exponentially in the past week. Uh, Fanos uh, uh, Panny... <coughs> I knew I'd... Uh, uh, Panny is. <laughs> Panny is. I have a lot of uh, Greek viewers, and so I know you won't mind, but that they'll probably wring my neck for, 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 for mispronouncing. Uh, now, uh, thank you so much, uh, Fanos, for uh, agreeing to, to, to come on uh, the show uh, tonight. I know you said in your uh, Facebook Live videos that you will not speak to the mainstream media, as uh, on Sunday they had reporters on the ground, but deliberately in their news reports that e evening uh, misrepresented uh, what happened. And uh, so you've been live streaming into your Facebook group, 99% uh, Unite, uh, it's, yep. us, it's us or, or them. And you were taken away. Uh, I saw they, they grabbed your face uh, when you were reading a Bible, Bible verse about the, the mark of the beast and, and microchips, where in my opinion, it's the most egregious, uh, I, I, I would say, abuse of, uh, uh, of uh, police, police powers and uh, uh, the worst violation of the, the right to free speech and free assembly I've ever seen. Uh, and I've attended uh, and covered a lot of these protests. Yeah, so, um, look, the, the whole thing about saying the mark of the beast wasn't about... Um, it wasn't about trying to be religious as such. It was trying about it was trying to be about showing that this stuff's been spoken about hundreds of years ago, and what they're looking at implementing and what they're doing at the moment is all working towards a cashless, monitored society where everyone's got a microchip and everyone's tracked. Which is, and people, uh, I would say, uh, are rightly uh, suspicious about the. Uh, how we're taught we've been told uh, during this uh pandemic not to use uh, cash the 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 yeah, touching yeah. touch and go limits in supermarkets and other places have been increased to i think 200 dollars but i am noticing now a lot of businesses starting to accept cash again albeit reluctantly because we've all seen australian money says legal tender yeah so um, it's really inconvenient if you look at the laws that started passing and everything that started falling into place quite conveniently, um, trying to pass bills so you can't spend more than $10,000 at a time and make it a criminal offence if you do have that much money on you, right? Getting rid of cash as it's uh, seen as a vehicle to transmit the virus, but it can't spread on, you know, the, uh, the stainless steel rail at the train station or the rubber... Um, uh, the, the rubber guide that you carry up the escalators at a train station or you can't get it off the peas when you grab them off the shelf and put them back, you know? Like, it's ridiculous that, you know, they're, they're so quick to just get rid of cash out of society and using the virus as a vehicle to do so. I think that's very, um, you know, very convenient, wouldn't you say? Well, it, it aligns to two goals, and I certainly, this is my perspective, I'm, uh, you can go into your, your own perspective, yeah. but I don't believe that there's an overall, uh, uh, well, there, it was planned this uh, pandemic, but in my experience, in every crisis, there's an opportunity for people who have various agendas to, to implement it. Obviously, I would like to see uh, uh, 
us emerge from this uh, pandemic as a more free and independent nation. But uh, uh, of course, there, there's other, uh, other uh, political players who've got uh, other ideas. And you mentioned the, obvi obviously the, the microchip, which they've been trying to get those installed in people since 9-11, uh, uh, but uh, they're being a bit more subtle now. And obvious, uh, the most obvious example of how they want to track us is through the, the COVID safe uh, tr uh, tracking app. And I'm going to- already talk, being talked about through parliament though, don't you? The, the microchip. <laughs> There's something called emerging technologies and part of the emergency emerging technologies that they're considering right that they're looking to bring into power are biometric passports which is a me measurement of a part of your body like checking the shape of your eye or your palm print or whatever else as identifying who you are and an implantable microchip so this isn't science fiction they're talking about it and it's get they're getting ready to implement it and the, and the five and this track this this covid safe app that's designed to track um, the death of what we've had 98 people die in 16 weeks and we're dealing with a pandemic really and you want to implement an app that's not even effective in the way it works in its functionality to um, in the interest of public safety yet it's not going to stop no virus from getting around that doesn't make sense and everyone's forgotten that uh, I actually uh it, it did uh, in-depth research today on uh, the uh, deadly flu season we had during 2019. And my audience knows that I uh, got the flu last winter. So I did a lot of my colleagues and associates. I was knocked down for three weeks. So it was absolutely horrible. 900 Australians died of the flu last year and we didn't shut down the economy and right. have mass surveillance. And in 2017, actually 1,100 people died uh, that year. And the, the, uh, the obvious, and going through the, sorry, I'm just going to, uh, I'll bring up the, the, docu the, the document here. Uh, so there was a, to a total number of, of cases last Last winter, 300, uh, 310,000 people presented to Australian health services with influenza, and a lot of people would have just soldiered on. Yeah, we've shut down and introduced surveillance because of uh, 7,000 infections and 98 deaths. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's not even 7,000. It's less than 7,000. It's 6,900 and something. Mm. It's ridiculous. The amount of... The amount of deaths, sorry to, you know, uh, correct you. <laughs> um, I know you were just rounding it off. Yeah. Uh, Wasn't rounding really, it off to exaggerate. That's the, that's the difference. Yeah, 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 yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. I, I get, I get, I understand that you don't have sinister motives for why you're doing your show, man. That's what I'm talking about, um, Tim. Um, look, at the end of the day, what they're, what they're doing is, is ridiculous. It doesn't make sense. If anything, the level of deaths that the amount of deaths that have happened due to other things in the world have dramatically decreased, especially in Australia, right? Um, you know, and they've inflated, they've, and the figures that they're presenting, I've got inside information of healthcare workers who have told me and people that have gone to hospitals that their family members have been listed as a death, as a symptom, as with symptoms of coronavirus. You don't, as a as a physician, uh, announce a death of someone because of the symptoms of an, an illness. You announce them dead because of what killed them: lung failure, heart failure, you know, um, a, a blood a blood clot in the brain, you know, which caused something else. So for them to come and say something ridiculous like someone died as of symptoms of something else, that's the biggest. It just doesn't make sense. That's not accurate. That's just you know, how do you go against everything that you've ever done before? And now your rationale can be explained because of what um, a directive that's been given to you by, a, by an upper organisation that has nothing to do with the way you do your job. World Health Organisation doesn't make sense. Uh, the, uh, those types of or mis, uh, mis uh, diagnosis of, of cause of death, uh, they've been, they've seeped out into the the online sphere and obviously like uh, it, 
we've talked about the, the, the powers that government can accure uh, through new technology, but they can also be used uh, uh, to the people's advantage as well. Uh, you are talking to me right now through a, a smartphone, which there yep. were countless smart, smartphones that were filming uh, uh, Sunday's Mother's Day anti-lockdown protest, and we're able to see exactly uh, what happened uh, throughout uh, the, the day and who clearly was uh, the aggressor, which you wouldn't get from the one minute report from seven or, or nine news that evening. No, you wouldn't. Um, if you if you had a chance to see the speech I said, um, even after the way the police had treated people, I still gave the police accolades and said that their job's easy because I've worked in, a, in an environment where you have to maintain order, right? Even after what they'd done by dragging one of the one of the uh, the speakers there and smashing his head into the ground when they arrested him, when he when there was no need to, right? And when they didn't even have a power to arrest him because you know not following a public health order is not an indictable offence, right? There's no need to use that type of force and grab that person, right? And they grabbed people when they felt like it, not when they saw them because there was hundreds of people there. So why did they only grab the people who they saw were um, some type of, uh, let's say, an influencer or a person who was a person of, um, you know, of priority there, so to speak, or a person who was um, someone who had, you know, a part in it, if that makes sense. It seemed to, to me, looking at it, uh, that the police uh, just sort of, they, they acted out of panic, like we've got to do something because we're taking orders uh, from above. And when any uh, uh, type of authority person is, is not thinking rationally and, and panicking, that's a... a, 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 a a disaster like that uh, can occur. I, I noticed uh, in the in the footage I had uh, on a couple of weeks back, uh, uh, Nick Patterson, who is keeping his uh, MMA uh, training clinic open, he was thrown to the ground uh, by police and and put in 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 the back of the paddy wagon. The uh, uh, Victoria Police said they made ten arrests and they were, uh, and these people were given summons. Uh, a summons to appear in court and three were charged with assault of police. They didn't give me a summons to appear in court. I even said to them, um, so what am I, uh, what are you guys going to do? And they go, oh, you'll receive an infringement. I go, okay. I go, is that a summary offence then? They go, yeah. I go, okay. No problem. So under section 458, subsection three, reason no longer continues. I can go now, right? And the police said, yep. Yeah. And within 25 minutes after the, uh, them opening the door to the van, they let me straight out. Didn't tell me I was going to have a summons to appear in court. Didn't tell me anything like that. Because the fact of the matter is, the reason they're affecting, they're, they're, they're arresting people is against a public health directive, not a law. There's a difference between a directive and a regulation and a law. A law goes through two houses of parliament and then does royal assent and is approved by the Queen. Right? These directives haven't been approved by anyone apart from the Queen of Australia, which doesn't even exist. It's a corporation. There's no such thing as the Queen of Australia. So every, every law these guys have been writing, circa 1970, doesn't actually hold water. And everything they're actually doing at the moment isn't, doesn't actually have a proper legal standing. But as Winston Churchill said, the length of the document defends it against being read. I've heard uh, uh, that type of argument uh, before. And uh, I have the, the Know Your Rights uh, advocates uh, 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 they certainly uh, educate uh, people on on on, the, on those sort of uh, uh, Ill legal irregularities but yep. the, the way that I see it at the end of the day it's the it's the people or the sheeple who who, who still they they provide the legitimacy through their obedience to uh, governments police, forces and that and the reason they've been able to give these uh, uh, penalty infringement notices out uh, so so frequently is because uh, the people have have just 
accepted it. I'm not sure if anyone has been foolish enough to pay uh, 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 the, the $1,658 fine to be uh, exact. They're, they're a fool if they do, but you're also a fool if, if police pull you over and ask where you are and you tell them and then they deem, oh, that's not an essential. You should say none of your business because then they don't know why you're out. Well, technically, you don't need to tell the police unless you have been arrested. Because I, I, I used to teach security, so I understand the powers of arrest very well. And that the Section 458 and Section 459, police have certain powers to arrest. Now, the powers to arrest that police have come under Section 458, and Section 458 has certain um, parameters that need to be followed. But a civilian arrests with very much of the same powers as police do under Section 458. And if you're going to stop someone for no reason and ask them, tell them to identify themselves, they don't need to because they have the right to go. Technically, if a person asks, am I under arrest or am I free to go, until the officer says you're under arrest, Technically, they don't need to give their name and address because there's no legal standing for the police to be stopping them from their liberties as a free person to choose to go where they please. Yeah? They have to say, I, need, I have a reasonable belief that you've committed some, you've committed an offence. They have to say that. They have to have a reasonable belief that you've committed some type of offence. Otherwise, what they're doing is just abusing power that they don't even have that they think they have because they think it's been instilled upon them but they don't have it. And they're, they're working out of this um, illusion that, you know, they, they're well within their rights because they've been given orders to, and it's a, it's, it's a directive. I'm sorry, it's a directive. It's not a law. There's a big difference. Uh, so if they uh, claim, uh, and I'm going to uh, put it put it in put it in, in in that terms that their authority comes from this uh, declaration of uh, a state of emergency and which has been it was due to expire on May 11th and now has been uh, extended until uh, May May 31st and this has been uh, this has been an act of Parliament the Emergency Management Act of, of 2013 which uh, to best of my knowledge, came out of a recommendation of the the bushfires uh, royal commission, and but the the, the premier can just enact it uh, when when it, whenever he likes. It's a huge amount of executive uh, power, and uh, of of course it was uh, I think fitting that um, the the demonstration was on Mother's Day when. Uh, Victorians were 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 were, were, to were told. Um, well, uh, when when they say asked or, or told, it's mean we'll uh, uh, we're making it illegal for you to visit your mother uh, on on Mother's Day. And well, they alluded to it. Yeah, mm. they didn't say you can't, but they said you probably it would probably be a good idea if you're thinking about it. Probably don't. Yeah. Mm. Because uh, Daniel Andrews, he actually said it in this in his extended press conference uh, that we don't want uh, anyone to the morgue after after Mother's Day. That visiting your mother, you could uh, kill her. And I'm not sure if you remember the the so-called bonking ban, which lasted six hours. That uh, Daniel Andrews said visiting your partner who you don't live with uh, that's not a legitimate uh, form of of medical care. Because is that really worth a life? That you could kill somebody by getting in your car, driving to your partner who you didn't live with and spending time or, or whatever. This was the absurdity of the, the situation. To your knowledge, have you killed anyone during this, this pandemic by uh, meeting people? Yeah, so say that question again, Tim, the uh, last part. Have you killed anyone during this pandemic by yeah. meeting with them? No. <laughs> Definitely not, not at the moment. Because that was uh, well, the uh, the health uh, authorities uh, there. Uh, uh, what what they said to to the protesters that you're putting the the community uh, at risk. Though of course people don't have to associate with you if they don't want to. If they see you down the street, they can just walk away. Yeah. So um, listen, if I had seen a virus that was infectious and contagious like it was claimed to be, had ripped through Australia like wildfire, and we had two, 300,000 people in hospital, I would have created a movement that kept people in their home. 
right? The only reason those people were standing on those steps, and I'm not taking ownership of that because I didn't organise it. I heard there was going to be something on Sunday, and I said, screw it, let's go down as well, right? Now, um, in regards to uh, a public health concern, okay, what about when there's 50 or 60 customers that walk into Bunnings? Or, um, you know, when there's 30, 40 plus people work or walk into a supermarket picking stuff and putting it back? Or when that person who's putting the groceries through is standing in front of maybe 60 or 70 people a day and they're being breathed on? Right, you think everyone's standing a metre and a half away? What about the cops that are going and grabbing someone six or seven at a time? So... Let me get this right. You're, in, you're out there in the interest of public safety, standing there with a pram on his own, not, in, not near anyone, and you went and, in the interest of public safety, approached that person with seven or eight police, stood within one and a half metres of them, which is your um, golden rule not to do, and then arrested that person when they're... What, they were, what, they were, what were they doing, just standing there? So you're, you can violate public health public safety because your job's essential? I'm sorry, I don't get that. So because your job's essential, does that mean the virus won't spread when you're standing one and a half metres within each other? So how come this thing hasn't spread through Victoria Police like wildfire if it's so, if it's so contagious? And Why hasn't it gone through there like wildfire considering these guys almost sit on top of each other? Because what the virus chooses where it goes now. So we've got a virus that um, is intelligent and doesn't go after law enforcement. It only goes after the guy who wants to go throw a fishing rod in the water or um, the people who are speaking about their concerns. And I said it when I was there. I said, I'm not here to protest. I said, we're here to ask questions. We're here to demand answers. We're here to ask questions. Why? Because people have sent letters into government. No one's answered. People have sent letters into their political parties and gone through the right channels. No one's replied back. Right? We're here because we're getting told to download an app when there's 98 people dead in six in 16 weeks and I have to download an app to go somewhere. We're here to have our answers, our questions answered. I wasn't there for a 5G conspiracy theory thing, right? I wasn't there about Bill Gates and microchips and all the other crap they were talking about, even though half that stuff's still true, right? I wasn't there voicing that stuff because that is not the forum you have that type of uh, conversation. I was there to have an honest, proper, concerning um, uh, speak out about what's going on. And the reason the police grabbed me is because they knew that everything I said, that everyone was hearing it and everyone was, re and everyone was uh, reflecting with what I was saying and they were taking it in, right? And they saw me as a danger and a threat, the whole narrative that's what's going on at the moment. And that's really why they dragged me away because they saw me there the whole day and they didn't drag me away until they saw me getting ready to out the fact that people want to put a microchip in everyone, and that's been spoken about in Scripture for hundreds of years, and the same Bible that I wasn't allowed to read from was from the same Bible that all our laws are founded upon because most of our laws from England go back to King James Bible, right? So you're telling me we can have laws based upon the King James Bible, but I can't recite a section of scripture, which I didn't even say was the Bible, I just said scripture, that was about the mark of the beast and how it was relevant to something that was written a hundred years ago, uh, hundreds of years ago, really, and nothing there. And you broke social distancing. You went through a group of people to grab me. And you're telling me that I was there and I was the one who didn't have the, the, the uh, public health and safety in mind. Really, I'm sorry, but that, to me, that doesn't make sense. And to the 45,000 people or whatever else that are supporting me these days, they also see that this is a load of crap. Yeah, you're, you're spot on with about the how the government defines what's essential and, and non-essential. And well, there's only been one or the, the one coronavirus outbreak uh, at an essential business and that's that uh, Cedar Meats in, in Brooklyn in, in Western Melbourne. There's been no cluster at any of the, the supermarkets or, or hairdressers. Uh, there's been no community transition at... Shopping centres, 
fire stations, ambulance stations, police stations, government buildings, Centrelink and all these other places that are wall to wall with people. You're telling me there was none. There was no infections that went rampant through any of these places, but Cedar Meats. So the virus chose where it spread once to go. That's what the government's telling people, and they expect anyone with half a brain who has a sense of intelligence to believe that. And holding a government to account who is making the decisions about how to contain the virus is not an essential activity. That is quite convenient. Yeah, yeah, 100%. You know, um, look, <laughs> certain things you could look at and you go, okay, this makes sense. All right. But you can't say it's one way and then people aren't getting sick in another from the exact same circumstances. You can't say that people can't gather in a cafe and eat, but people can gather at the police station and be on top of each other and it doesn't spread. If it's, if it's contagious, it's contagious everywhere. It's not just contagious where it suits the government's narrative. That doesn't make sense. Anyone with anyone with any type of like common sense looking at all the situation would say, well, hang on. Go and have a look at these construction sites in the city where they're doing these multi-level buildings. Uh, no right? cases there. You'd easily have 150 people working in these buildings, maybe 200 working in some of these construction sites. Where do they sit? They sit communally and eat in the lunch sets. Apparently, they don't even practice social distancing in them. Right? So no one got sick there. Not one construction site got shut down in the whole time this COVID was happening. Really, I find that convenient considering the people who would own those and be running them would be the big guys. The guys who, you know, are part of the, you know, the upper quadrant of the people that control this world. Right? I find it very convenient that out of all the government institutions that have to do with controlling and maintaining order, there, was, there hasn't been, um, you know, a COVID outbreak. Okay, yeah, that was one case. So how come there wasn't an outbreak? People are asymptomatic for up to two weeks, right? People could can be asymptomatic and be transferable for 48 hours. So how come during that time, no one at a police station got people sick, right? No one at an ambulance station got people sick. No one in the supermarket got people sick. No one in a construction site got people sick and had to shut down a construction site. Why? Doesn't make sense. Well, you're not going to get any disagreement uh, from me on that. But the, the reason I think people became so compliant, and at the beginning I did uh, support some of the, the social distancing, I didn't support a, a lockdown and, ha and house arrest because we didn't know much about this virus and fear of the unknown. That's what fueled oh, the, the panic buying. And we were told that the virus could be airborne and that it could be on surfaces to three or four days, but it doesn't seem that it is any more uh, contagious than the than the flu. Obviously, it's not uh, the flu, but I just told you how last winter that the, the flu was transmitted within uh, my uh, circle, uh, which uh, we're told that this is super, uh, su super contagious. And we, we were told that the deal was we've got to flatten the curve so our ICU wards aren't overwhelmed. We did that. As soon as that uh, happened, then all these shutdowns should have ended. But then, of course, the government moved the, the goalpost and said, oh, uh, there might be a second and third wave. I'm not sure if you remember, Daniel Andrews wanted the uh, convention uh, exhibition centre for a, a morgue. Yeah, we dropped out. Oh, what, was the, what was the last you heard? Um, moved in the goalposts. Yes, how we've achieved flattening the curve, but things aren't allowed to go back to normal. That wasn't the first goalpost they moved before they said second or third wave. They said, we want to track you. They said that that's the only way we'll go back to normal. And they said they want to stick us with a vaccine for a virus that's been, that was around for four months. They didn't even know how to test it properly yet. And they didn't even, mate, they couldn't even confirm this thing was real. And the government was already pushing vaccines for it. 
Well, they, they, uh, we've been told, and because there's, there's never been a, a vaccine developed for any strand of the, the coronavirus, this is called COVID-19, uh, this strand, it's also called uh, bat uh, coronavirus as well, but they, they, they want to, and we don't do this with the normal flu, track the exact source of the, the, the transmission. And people, uh, they've forgotten that the, basically it's, well, it's not a, a secret ingredient, but it's, it's an untold ingredient of flattening the curve was shutting Australia's borders. That's what really killed the virus, not because uh, people weren't coming in from overseas. There was mandatory quarantine. So how is this, if we've got uh, around 600 active cases now, how are we uh, supposed to go from here if we don't reopen international travel to uh, Italy where they have the, uh, those factories full of hospital beds and coffins? I don't get how it's going to go. It's going to exponentially go from there. Well, look, according to the way they said this thing spreads, if just one person gets out in 16 weeks, you'd have another, th you'd have another, um, what did I, I calculate? I calculated compounding the doubling effect over 15 weeks of the number doubling each week of who was affected the week before. Um, from one person just affecting one person over 15 weeks is 32,000 people. So if they're saying these things so, like, super contagious, we haven't even locked down the whole country yet. So they're talking about it for second and third wave. Second and third wave from where? Hmm. Virus has already come through. So where's the second and third wave coming from exactly? Well, they say that there could be undetected cases uh, in uh, the populace, which if they're, they're undetected, yep. then obviously those people are not going to be showing enough symptoms for them to be in ICU or even hospital. Which so is, they're, saying, they're, they're saying there's undetected cases? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Um, and what's the question? The... I, I'm saying I, 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 I've, I, I'm asking you to respond to to their theory that uh, a, a, that uh, we need to continue lockdown and widespread testing because we need to uh, detect more cases of the virus, even though these people are already in the community asymptomatic, maybe passing it on, uh, but they don't have enough symptoms to go to hospital or the ICU ward. You're telling me there's a virus out there that's deadly. Right? And people could be asymptomatic and passing it on and no one's dying. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Well, that's what they're saying. So you're full of shit, excuse my language. The virus isn't as deadly as you say it is then. Well, well if it was, where's all the people that are getting sick and dying? Well, we right? Had, we, we had... Sick and dying then? We had, of the, the 98 Australians who've died... Only one is, is under 50. We've obviously heard the uh, reports from overseas of apparently children and young people dying from coronavirus that apparently uh, cripples your immune system like AIDS. There hasn't been any young Australians who, who that's happened to. So I guess the, well, uh, the only logical thing is that Australians are a bit made, made of a bit tougher, tougher things than apparently young people overseas. Listen to the logic. Right? This is, this is how ridiculous what they're saying is. Right? Listen to the logic. They're saying we need to test people because there's people out there that are asymptomatic spreading this thing. Right? You've had 6,900 and something cases, almost 7,000. It's been 16 weeks. The virus after two weeks is meant to show symptoms, right? Yeah? Or you're meant to start getting sick. So this thing's either not deadly and people have got it, and it's not as dangerous as they say it is, or they're lying and it doesn't exist. Because you can't say, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't say to me, oh, this virus is so deadly, we need to shut everything down because it's dangerous, people are dying, and then turn around saying, oh, for four months, people could be walking around, they're asymptomatic spreading it, it's deadly, but no one's dying. doesn't matter which way you slice it, 98 people die. So what they're requesting of the public doesn't make sense. Every, every single time they come out with more information 
more facts they want to do, more actions they want to take, they don't align with the information that's being provided and they don't align with the, with the rationale for how deadly and infectious this thing's meant to be. It doesn't make sense at all. Well, if you look at the high-profile uh, people in Australia who've got the, the coronavirus, obviously uh, Tom Hanks was the, the first big name. He made a full recovery, wasn't really that sick. He gave it to, well, I think his wife did, Rita Wilson, gave it to uh, Richard Wilkins, the, the Channel 9 celebrity reporter, and he said, I feel perfectly fine even though I've tested positive. Uh, Peter Dutton, Senator Andrew Bragg, uh, Senator Rex Patrick, they all got the coronavirus, made a... A, a full recovery. Flu. So what happened to the flu? The flu stopped and the coronavirus came through. No one caught the flu. Well, so they... the flu stopped when the coronavirus came through. That's what they're saying. So the influenza, that's extremely uh, contagious, decided to stop. And now it was only coronavirus that people were subjected to. Well, if you have a look at uh, how this year's flu season is unpan unpanning, 80% uh, reduction in normal influenza yeah. infections. That, that's not because of the lockdown. That's because we're washing our hands more, the sanitizing and that, uh, get, uh, uh, ma making sure that we're practicing better hygiene than maybe we did a year ago when we probably all got a, a bit slack, which is that's not a bad thing, but doesn't mean you're locked down society. I, I personally don't believe that. I don't believe that's um, it's because that's because that's why the influenza has been lower. It's because people aren't outside in the millions like they were, and people aren't catching it. That's it. You know what I mean? Like I don't bloody sanitize my hands every two seconds. I believe I have immune system, and I use my, you know, my nails and stuff like that. You know, that stuff there is your body's natural ability to build up an immune system. You know, you get you get bacteria under your fingernails. What's a natural human inclination to bite your nails, right? You bite your nails because your body is trying to pick up all of this bacteria you're picking up around you. Your nose connects to your mouth immediately straight to your mouth, right? It's because your airborne bacteria is being caught on the mucus in your nose and you're breathing that, you're cleaning that through your mouth and spitting it out. That's why it connects because you're building your immune system. So why are people not getting a sick with the flu? Because people haven't been outside catching it. You know what I mean? It's an airborne thing. So I don't care how much you sanitize your hands, you can still catch it by breathing it in. Oh, but, yes, definitely. They're not... You see what I mean? How... Look, I'm the type of person that if something doesn't make sense, I don't care who tells me, I'll go and see... I'll go and figure it out and I'll, I'll make my own decision. Right, and from the day go when all of this started, it just nothing seemed correct with the way this thing was spreading, with the concentration in certain countries but not other countries. Um, when it first came out in China, the countries surrounding China had not one case. And then you go and look at the fact that if this virus is meant to be asymptomatic for 14 days, right? True. These are facts. If the virus is asymptomatic for 14 days and they didn't know that people were sick in Wuhan and still they started getting uh, cases, how did they stop the spread of the virus in Wuhan only? What, not one person made their way out of Wuhan into another part of China and started breathing on someone? Is that what you're telling me? This thing, what, how are you going to know every single person that was at that market during that time? No one left. Not one person got out into China and spread that thing like wildfire Ooh. until they figured out they were out there. You know, they wouldn't have even known they were sick for 48 hours or, or for, for two weeks. And they would, have, they would have been spreading the virus and not even felt any symptom, symptoms for 48 hours, if not even longer, according to, you know, the gospel, the World Health Organization. Uh, now, uh, uh, even though uh, you're uh, not responding to, to the mainstream media, they're, they're doing pr plenty of, of profiles on you, and uh, they always mentioned that uh, you were on uh, reality TV back in, in 2017 with your... Say your family's name again so it processes with, with, with me. Yeah, what, say that again. Your, your family name, your, your surname. 
Patties. 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 Yeah. Patties. Yeah. The Patties uh, family was on this reality TV show called Family Food Fight. I didn't watch it. I don't watch much reality uh, TV. Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, what uh, you've gone th- uh, you're going through now with, with activism is is nothing. Uh, like that. And they've also profiled uh, other anti-lockdown campaigners, Victor Tay, who runs the the Exercise Your Rights Facebook page in in Sydney. I'm not an anti-lockdown activist. I am government stop bullshitting to your people activist. I don't care if you leave me locked in my house for another month. But tell the start telling the people the truth because you gov the information you're telling people is is it it doesn't make sense. The, the, the measures you're putting in place aren't practical, right? And the, the the news that people are reporting about how dangerous this thing is completely inaccurate. I'm not an anti-lockdown protester, mate. I am a pro-truth advocate. Well, I've got down on your description, anti-lockdown activist, so yeah. <laughs> you forgive me for that. No, that's okay, because that's how they're all trying to paint me at the moment. Because what they want to do, right, they want to they want to villainize me so that the Australian public don't listen to what I've got to say because they know I'm a danger. And the reason they're doing it and the reason they're going through anti-lockdown is because if they're saying I'm an anti-lockdown activist and that shows, that sets the scene of, uh, you know, gives me the facade, I don't have the public's best interest in mind. But I do. Only reason I'm not following this anti-lockdown crap because it's a load of bullshit and they're, they're lying to everybody about it. Oh, and we can't keep living this uh, quality of life being being under house arrest. People have rightly talked about, well, they, when we say economic impact, that's uh, businesses going going under, which is a trigger for, for family breakdowns, mental health, suicides. We've had mental health experts come out. Who knows what will be the, uh, the, the lockdown uh, death toll in the next year or two people haven't haven't thought about that well look at the end of the day let's say for instance let's just put a let's just put an idea out there let's say for instance there was a controlling interest that would like to um you know rewrite the laws and take control of a people right let's say there was formulating a virus out of fear that would make people want to stay in their homes and Conveniently so, with that same virus, you could implement measures in the interest of public safety that would make sure people stand one and a half metres away from each other. Though a sneeze can travel six metres, so that uh, one and a half metres ain't going to do nothing to stop the spread of a virus, right? And then you uh, get rid of public gatherings of more than 10 people, so even if people wanted to protest, they can't because you can protest, that's okay, but you can't stand with more than 10 people. Right, so if they knew there was going to be an uprising or any type of resistance towards the movement, right, well, they've got laws in place that are well engineered to take advantage of the fact that, um, you know, if people try to speak out, they're not going to be able to because of the fact of the, the laws that have been implemented in the interest of public safety and they know that people are going to back them with these laws because of the fact that, they're going to think they're, they're for public safety. So no matter what happens to people out there, because they're trying to speak up, they're just going to see be seen as people that don't care about people and don't care about people's lives. So it's perfect. It's a perfect plan. Like whoever created what's going on is absolutely brilliant what they're doing. That's how well it's planned. It's disgusting to people, but from a strategic standpoint, what they've done and how they've implemented it, Man, you are dealing with some very, very, very intelligent people who understand behavioural science to a T. They understand how to manipulate the media. They understand how to manipulate people through fear, right? And they understand how to use the police and all that stuff in order to intimidate people to maintain the narrative of the government will maintain control in the interest of public safety. Uh, in my experience, uh, uh, that's just uh, p- uh, political uh, salesmanship that they've been able to, to sell it 
uh, to the pit. And there's still plenty of, of petrified people who won't even touch their, their mail, even, even, even though a, it, 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 if you get a package it, it, the, and somebody's got coronavirus or had coronavirus who packed it, it's gone in 24 hours because it's cardboard. Uh, that is the actual medical advice. I think it was. Oh, 24 is is what I, what I read. They said if it arrives the next day, then it's 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 not going to be infected. But um, you mentioned the, the, that they 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 called it a lot of the media anti anti vaxxer anti five G uh, pro, uh, protests, and we're seeing sort of the well. Uh, uh, we don't know whether there's going to be a vaccine for coronavirus, but they're urging everyone to get the, the annual flu vaccine, even though that doesn't protect against coronavirus. And you're seeing these no. NRL rugby players who will be banned from entering Queensland if they don't get the flu vaccination. And defending people's personal choice about what enters their body, that, is, that doesn't make you an anti-vaxxer. You can't force medicate no. anyone or force inject you can, just can't do that. That's anti-freedom, period. No, you can't. Of course you can't. Um, look, anti-vaxxers and all this, I've had a tuberculosis shot. You know, I've dealt with, um, you know, shots for malaria and stuff when I had to go overseas to Nepal. I've had hep A shots, hep B shots, right? I've had a tetanus injection. I don't have a problem with that. I'm not going to take an injection for a seasonal flu. I've never had one. I've never needed one. I've walked through. I've been in an office with hundreds of people that had a virus, had the flu, and everyone was dropping like flies, and I was the only one who didn't get sick. Right? And now you're going to turn around and say that the best way to combat a virus that you guys don't even really know about is to stick the whole population with a virus, with a, with a, with a vaccine that usually you guys would take 10 years to create and test before you implement. I'm sorry, no conflict of interest there whatsoever with the guys at the top. Let's not see if one of these politicians' wives or whatever else has interest in one of these pharmaceutical companies that are going to be uh, implementing these vaccines. Because let's, uh, let's, let's put it this way, vaccines make money for the pharmaceutical companies. And if you want to know how the pharmaceutical companies act, uh, operate when it comes to vaccines, from my group, I have a person, a female, who uh, just for a laugh decided to hop into a anti-vaccine group and, you know, just have a chat and see what their views were. When she went in there, the anti-vaccine people were pro-vaccine pushers. They were pushing pro-vaccines, right? They were pushing vaccines on people and saying how good they were. Now, she found that very peculiar. So I think a couple of days later, someone got in contact with her out of one of these uh, sites, out of one of these pages. And he said to her, hey, listen, out of one of these groups, he said, hey, listen, he said, I, I don't want you anyone to know this. I need to be careful speaking to you. But everyone in there are actually being paid by the pharmaceutical companies to push vaccines. All right? This is what she said. Now, she spoke to him later on. Um, and she said, so how does it work? He goes, a handler gets in contact with us and we get paid by us by a separate company that has nothing to do with the pharmaceutical company. But we work for GSK. This is what pharmaceutical companies are doing. Well, it's a smart, I, I would say, paying influencers is, uh, yeah. that's the in word at the moment. That sounds like smart, smart business. Yeah, so... Look, I'm not an anti-vaxxer, man. I'm not an anti-5G person. I am a person who is not going to just let a government implement measures because they say they're safe when there are studies that all around the world that are, that are turning around and there are people all around the world who are successfully stopping the implementation of these towers. They're not stopping them because they're just handing them a piece of paper. They're obviously coming up with some substantiated evidence to back up their claim. Otherwise, the government's not just going to turn around and stop the, stop these things being built in certain areas. It doesn't work like that. You have to have some type of evidence to back up your claim, right? I'm not an anti-5G person. 
I am pro intelligence, and if something has got has has a, has a possibility to hurt someone, then it shouldn't be implemented. Why did they get rid of solariums? One person died, and they got rid of them. Right? Government had nothing to gain from it, but they were happy to destroy all these businesses in the process. Right? True. Well, What's Sid that got to do? Sydney lockout laws, two one punch death. They shut down all of Sydney's nightlife. Yeah, yeah, right. So, look, at the end of the day, it's not about the interests of public safety. It's about what's best for the people up, up there and who's going to get their pockets lined the best. And you can see it with, with everything that happens when you see cotton mills taking away all the water from, uh, you know, a major water outlet, you know, like the Darling River Basin, right? And the, and the, and the farmers are starving, really. That, that's okay. That's, that's really in the interest of Australian people. Yeah? So... You know, people to sit there and say, you know, I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I'm not an anti-5G. I am a person who is sticking up for people because I'm, I'm sick of all the, all the lies and I'm sick of all the deception. I'm sick of all the, the, the media manipulating all the facts and only, only telling people half the story, right? And it's time, it's honestly time for some people to be brought to account for what they're doing because at the moment, they're not just hurting a, a reputation of someone. They are endangering the entire, like, mental health of a whole country at the moment, right? Nothing they're doing right now makes sense. And as I said, man, I'm not, I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I'm not anti-5G. I'm not anti-lockdowns. I am pro. Tell us the truth and stop lying to us. That might be a good note to, to end on. I've got my next guest uh, on hold. Uh, so... Uh, just briefly, where to from here? Because obviously you've had uh, a crazy week. You mentioned over a thousand friend requests and messages. I was, I was, I was one of them. Uh, your group stands at 42,000 uh, members. So it's insane, yeah. Uh, 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 so where do you think you'll go uh, from here? Um, I wouldn't mind you giving me a plug to my YouTube channel that I've got going because I'm going to start putting some content up there, and that's 99% um, Unite YouTube channel. It's us versus them. Um, look, I've been contacted from a couple of media outlets. I'm not going to do interviews with them. Um, I'm working towards some stuff in the background, okay? I'm not going to fight the fact that the media is pushing some type of narrative that I'm a ex-reality TV star that's a conspiracy theorist. You know what? It just shows how threatened they are of me considering they're going through so much work to make me look like a goose. So that's a good thing. You know why? Because it means I'm pushing buttons in the right area and I'm, I'm, I'm doing actions that's hurting people in terms of their narrative and they're really trying to discredit me. So, you know what? More power to them. Um, yeah, so to cut it short, YouTube, more than likely my YouTube uh, channel, um, and I'm going to do some investigating and really bring out some proper stuff that's going to be hard to deny and, um, you know, possible legal action for some people who uh, are wrong by me. Well, well uh, I think all of us who have heard you tonight and, and seen your, your recent videos are certainly looking forward to that. Thank you so much uh, for your time. And, yeah, we'll, we'll certainly see more of you probably tomorrow with another video. Yeah, Tim, you're an absolute superstar, man. I love the way you run your show and, uh, you know, you do a great job and fantastic questions and really good flow, man. So, um, you know, Thanks, great mate. work. All the Thank best. Thank you so much. Great night, guys. See you all later. Bye-bye. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows and to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.